The National Football League, what more can you say? We're back. Roto Grinders food for thought and we're coming up on a critical week 14. What is week 14? It's the culmination of a lot of best ball drafts, of a lot of season long regular seasons. The NFL playoff picture is starting to wind down. We're seeing more contenders, more pretenders, some coaching changes, and a lot of drama. Thanks for sticking with us. Food for thought. It's December. I'm the Looch, and I'm with the Chief Will Priester. What's going on, brother? Good to see you again. Nothing much, man. I'm doing great. The NFL now stands for No Faith League. I don't have faith in anyone in the NFL. The NFL builds you up just to tear you right back down again. I don't trust anyone. And I'm saying that wholeheartedly. Let's go over the laundry list of teams that you thought you had a little faith in, and then they just went and wet the bed. The Denver Broncos. Yes, I know they were facing the Houston Texans. Yes, I know C.J. Stroud is incredible. Denver, you had a shot to separate yourself in the wild card. Uh, no more faith in Denver. They let you down. Oh, look, the Pittsburgh Steelers, they fight Met Canada. Oh, they still only scored 10 points. You thought they had a shot against the Cardinals at home. No more faith in the Steelers. We talked about this. You got the Philadelphia Eagles, which are last year's Minnesota Vikings. Oh, they're pulling out all these close games. Oh, the magic of Jalen Hurts. 49ers rolling in, stopped them 42 to 19. It's the no faith league. Oh, we got the Cleveland Browns. They got a backup quarterback, but this defense is generational. They go in, they face the Rams. They get mollywop 36 to 19. No faith league. We've got the reigning champs two-time champs, generational talent on the other side, Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, we're going to say that it was that uh, a no pass interference call at the end of the game. I get it. Doesn't matter. Scoreboard says 27-19, Green Bay, Jordan Love looking like the second coming of Brett Rogers. No faith. Lee, at this point, the Cincinnati Bengals at the recording of this show might as well roll into Jacksonville and steamroll them because I don't have any faith in them either with Jake Browning on the other side. The gap is so marginal between half the league. That's what makes it so maddening. And I'm in Northeastern PA. I was at the bar with a lot of sad Eagles fans, and boy, did that place clear out by about 6.30 last night. Or should I say six purdy? But Woo, good one. Oh, buddy. I mean, that might be the, so, that might be the but topic here's the, of this show. Here's the thing, though, Chief. Did the Eagles get absolutely destroyed on Sunday? The answer is yes. Do they still have as good of a chance as anybody to win the Super Bowl this year? I think the answer is still yes. If who, who how can we tier? Can we make like a little rankings tiered system here? I don't think anybody is on tier one all alone. And some people, but not most, before this Eagles 49ers game wanted to put Philadelphia on tier one. And I get it. One loss. Amazing start to the season. A win is a win. In the NFL, every single one of these teams has a gaping flaw. I think it's the first time in many years there is not one complete football team in my eyes in this league. We've seen a lot of teams get exposed. Okay, Philadelphia. What are their glaring holes? secondary is the big one and yeah. lack of creativity on defense no pass rush they just send four kevin byard didn't matter did kevin byard coming into town make a difference in that secondary absolutely not the secondary is the big eagles biggest problem right yep. so let's let's go down here what's the dallas cowboys biggest issue to you chief they can't be the elite teams or what we perceive to be the elite teams. And, and I'm going to say this retrospectively because I'm moving forward as if no one is safe any week. That's how I'm, that's how I'm moving forward the rest of the season. But I prior agree. to this, prior to this week, who can't the Cowboys beat? They can't beat Philly. They can't beat San Francisco. And that's who they're going to have to beat to get out of, out of the NFC to go to the Super Bowl. That's so that's what I'm saying about the Cowboys. Who cares if you beat the Giants? Who cares if you beat the Seahawks? Who cares if you beat Washington? Who cares if you beat the Jets? Like, who cares? 
beat the teams that you're supposed to beat that's going to actually put you in a mind frame, put you in that upper echelon to say, let's consider them a real Super Bowl contender. Dallas hasn't won a Super Bowl since 1993. Am, am, I, am I right on that, Luch? Somewhere, I think it's 1993 during the Jimmy Johnson era. This team hasn't actually won anything. They've won a lot of regular season football games, but in the playoffs, have they closed the deal? No. Talk to me after you close the deal. That you know what I'm saying? Like that, that's what I want to know. Can you close the deal? Can San Francisco close the deal? Can Philly close the deal? Philly closed the deal last year. They played great, but I don't see that same Philly team. And we've been talking about this for weeks. I don't see the same Philadelphia team that I saw from last season. The second is a secondary's crap. We saw Debo Samuel just run through this secondary all second half, moving the ball up and down the field. Christian McCaffrey, and I know this is this is this is part of their defense. Like Christian McCaffrey popping them for 10 yards here, 15 yards there. Brock Purdy looking like the second coming of Joe Montana. Like, you know, uh, Debo and Ayuk looking like Jerry Rice out there. Like, come on, Philly. Like, what, what is this? You're what right. is this? They're Who not is, I mean, as dominant what? as we've seen them in years past. And listen, and, and let me let me let me say this because Dallas did play this week. The Seahawks scored 35 points in this game. Okay. So I don't want to hear anything about this Dallas defense. Now, did Michael Parsons come up with a play at the end of the game to close it for them? Absolutely. Yes, I know they played on Thursday night. Yes, I know it was a short week. Yes, I know they didn't have all the time to prepare in the world. But guess what? This wasn't really a short week for Dallas, believe it or not. They just played on – oh, no. Yeah, they played on Thanksgiving, didn't they? Dallas played on Thanksgiving. So this wasn't a short week. So they don't even get that excuse. They just didn't play well. I know they scored 41 points. The defense was atrocious. They gave up 35 to Geno Smith. DK Metcalf looked like Megatron the whole game. Okay, I digress. I think Luke, those, three teams, here. those three teams are really interesting because defensively, Dallas likes to play man single high. So does Philadelphia. San Fran doesn't really run too high. It was supposed to be an A.J. Brown feast game. Couldn't get him the football. That's two. That's two games. Two big NFC games. What? What? That's two big NFC games where coverage should have favored AJ Brown, and they couldn't get him the football. But AJ had, game, AJ had the stats. I mean, there was some crap fourth quarter garbage. That's okay. But you get what I'm saying. You look at the stat sheet. You say AJ. Oh, over 100 yards again. They scored 19 points. Here, here was the problem with the Eagles. To me in that game, Lucha, and it, it feels like now we're talking about Eagles 49ers. I do think that was the pivotal game of the weekend. I will say that. I think that was the let's let's see who comes out of this one. This should be a defining moment. Here, here was the Eagles' problem. They moved the ball down the field early. They got two field goals, didn't they? Or one field goal? It was either one or two. They didn't put they didn't put the ball in, they didn't get a touchdown out of any of those two drives, and it snowballed on them. Luch, I'm convinced they get two touchdowns in that drive. This game is has a totally different outcome. Yeah, totally. But what happened? They got it and they couldn't put it in. And when you're playing a team, these types of teams, you got to score, and and you got to score. Now look, here's why: because you know your defense isn't going to slow this team down for very long. So the offense has this weight on its shoulders that says, "Hey, guys." If we get close, we got to score touchdowns against this particular team. You can get away with that with the Jets. You can get away with that with the Giants. You can get away with that with Washington. You can get away with that with the Panthers. You can get away with that with the Buccaneers. You can get away with that with the Cardinals. You can, And I'm naming all these bad teams for a reason. When you're not playing good football teams, you can get away with stagnant drives. When you're playing some of the best teams in the league, even with their deficiencies, you better score touchdowns. And, that, and really, to me, Luce, that's what this came down to the end. They didn't score the touchdowns early. Um, if they yeah. score two touchdowns, it's 14-0. And guess what? Now San Francisco has to play a different style of football. Maybe you, maybe you, maybe you make Purdy throw a bad throw because they're trying to keep pace. See, all those little things can happen when there's a different type of pressure. But when you go and get two drives, you score six points, and you look up, it's six to zero. Who cares? We could, we could go get a touchdown, and that's what happened. Touchdown, touchdown, touchdown. Before you look, it's 21 to 6. Just like that. I'm just saying, I mean, my, the biggest elephant in the room here, and we both kind of hit it, is the gap is small. There's no dominant team. Every team, even the quote-unquote good teams, have a glaring hole. 
right? The Eagles secondary, Dallas. I mean, you know, what what do you want to say about Dallas, right? I mean, they've had a, a pretty easy strength of schedule for the most part. Honestly, they could have beat Philadelphia a couple of weeks ago last month. Um, they've had some troubles running the ball in neutral situations. I mean, they have a decent rushing total, but there's nothing about their run game that kind of wows me anymore. Um, but mm. I, I actually, I don't mind the spot that so, Dallas is in. So I shocking think are, with Zeke going out of the building. It's amazing. Suddenly, they can't run the football at all. Zeke Elliott. Zeke Elliott might have been a lot more valuable to this team than they thought. I, I just think people are crapping on Dallas a little bit too much. Like, if you're going to – and I'm not saying you, but if you're going to say, oh, Dallas squeaked one out against Seattle, then, you know, you sh everyone should have been should have been giving the Eagles the same shit all season for win winning these one-score games as well. So, like, exactly. I feel like the Eagles and Dallas are closer to being on the same tier than maybe most people want to say that they are. Um, yeah. You know, here, the Kansas City Chiefs. The Kansas City Chiefs. Who would have thought we'd be sitting here, you know, a year and a half ago, fast forwarding to December 2023, saying the defense is the strength of this team because they have nobody on the outside. And that showed against Green Bay. It's been showing all year where, you know, you, you take away Travis Kelsey, who father time slowly catching up to, and you do what you can. And there's nobody else to make a play on this Chiefs team. The Chiefs have glaring holes at wide receiver. This deep, this blitzing man defense is carrying Kansas City, and it wasn't enough to beat Green Bay. You look at Buffalo. What's Buffalo's issue? Well, they have plenty of organizational issues. They're firing scapegoats all year. The defense has been bad. They abandoned the run game early in the year. Maybe it's too late for things to balance out. I did go ahead after our show last week and bet on Buffalo at 35-1 to 1 to win the Super Bowl because I think – the AFC is wide open and the league collectively may be pretty damn wide open and it's been pretty random. So I don't know if Buffalo is going to get hot and sneak in, but they have Kansas city next week coming off a of bye week. And are we, even, like, who's what tiers Kansas city on in this league? Uh, I'm saying all these teams have holes. The Detroit lions, right? We talked about how the media is prematurely crowning the Detroit lions. I'll tell you this chief on scores and odds. I went in and hammered the Detroit lions minus four last week. I checked the New Orleans injury report. They were missing still Marshawn Lattimore. They're missing starting safety Marcus May. Cameron Jordan was a game time decision and a non factor. Pete Werner, their top linebacker, was out. Rashid Shahid out. Michael Thomas out. Chris Olave cleared concussion protocol and played. That Saints team was about as banged up as a team as you're going to see. Guess Detroit what? went in there, let it all rip in the first quarter. 21 0. They couldn't close the door and they almost blew the game. They ended up covering on papers a win a win. But, geez, I mean, you give up almost, what, 30 points to that banged-up Saints team who used quarterback roulette, brings in Jameis Winston, Taysom Hills playing a third of the well, game. Well, here's why. Because Derek Carr gets in concussion protocol every game now. Every week, Luch, this is not an exaggeration. I am not kidding. Check the last three to four weeks. Derek Carr has been in concussion protocol, I think, almost every, every game he's left the game for something. And I got the extra large copy for this show because I knew and guess I what, Derek Carr? I want sure. you to listen to this. I hope our good friend, Mr. Derek Carr, is listening to this show. Mr. Derek Carr, please don't screw up my season long. You're doing fine. I just need you to average 175 passing yards for the rest of these games, which means, hey, buddy, we need that. We need you out there this week. That's an exaggeration. If Derek Carr actually has a concussion, I really want him to be okay. He should not be playing. But my point is, every week, Derek Carr just – Getting hurt, throwing for oh, he throws for over two hundred and he leaves the game. Come on, D Carr, let's get it done, buddy. Let's get it done. Uh, Luch, last thing for me on this particular segment is this: because of the wide openness of the league, here's what I think is going to happen. I think San Francisco is going to be is going to start to become the unquestioned favorite to win the Super Bowl. I gotta think that's in the cards now, right? Like they. they they're looking like the more dominant football team despite their record. They are right, right now. I'm looking right at scores now. and odds futures. They are three to one ish on most sports books right now. Right. And 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 to me, that probably makes sense because of their performance yesterday. Let me ask you this, Luke. So we were high on Buffalo last week because of their situation. Where is Detroit to win the Super Bowl? They the might. No, 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 no. Yet yeah, the odds. Do they have better odds than do they have worse odds than Buffalo? That is my question. They have better, they are 17 to 1, 13 to 1, 14 to 1. But I mean, because because they're all intensive purposes going to make the, the playoffs. Yeah, and, and they're gonna the win the NFC North. They're probably gonna win the NFC North. Right. 
Right. Okay. But but, but look, if the but vision it, didn't matter, if the vision but didn't matter, <laughs> talent wise, we'd be having yeah. a different discussion. It'd be close. Here's, here's my point though, Lutz. Remember, we don't trust any of these teams. We can take good teams, get great odds, and then guess what? I just need Detroit to get to the NFC Championship. I, I don't need them to win. Hedge. <laughs> Correct. I need. I just need them to get to the NFC Championship. That that's what I'm saying. Like. Well, and, and, and this we think of, Dallas is better than Detroit, but guess what? In a vacuum, th this team can shoot out with them. They got enough offensive weapons to shoot out with Dallas and close a game late. Here's why. Dan Campbell's going to be way more aggressive than Mike McCarthy in this game. He's going to roll the dice. A fourth and two, a fourth and three. A, you, you know what I'm saying? If it's three minutes left in the game, Dallas has no timeouts. Detroit's up three. It's fourth and three on the 30. They're not kicking a field goal. I can tell you that right now. They're going to try to get this first down. Why? Because they want to close the game out. Like that's Dan Campbell's MO. I've seen him do it time and time again. If they're up three with three minutes left, Dallas has no timeouts. As an example, Luke, Dan Campbell's not kicking that field goal when they're on the other side on Dallas's 30. They're not doing it. They're going to go for it. And if they get it, guess what? They beat Dallas in the playoff. This is what I'm saying. I don't trust anyone. Detroit could beat Philly. Right. They could. I'm, 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 sure. I'm saying if the here's the thing with Detroit, their defense isn't going to be there. If their offense shows up against Philly or 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 Dallas, they've got a shot to win. They just need their offense to go out there and compete right now. Because their defense isn't going to be there. We already know this, right? We've seen it. I, Saints 28. All the, if the Detroit Lions offense shows up, if Jared Goff doesn't have any turnovers, if Amon Ross St. Brown pops, if Jameer Gibbs pops, if David Montgomery can keep rolling, if Jameson Williams keeps ascending, if Sam Laporta does what he's supposed to do, Khalif Raymond catches a couple passes, Josh Reynolds catches a couple passes, you're going to look at the end of the game and go, oh, wait a minute, they just scored 35 points. The Cowboys have actually got to go win this game. Philly's got to go win this game. That's what I'm saying. Like, I don't, I don't see anyone that I feel 100% confident in, not even San Francisco. I'm and that's and, and that's saying a lot. Look, do I trust San Francisco? Yes. Do I trust what they have there? Yes. But I don't feel like they're the 2000 Baltimore Ravens. Are, are there <laughs> any are there any tier 1 teams right now or are there just okay. like five tier 2 teams? Let, well, well let, let, let me say this. Let's do it in terms of could we got to rank them where they are this season. I think if we said who are the tier 1 teams in the NFL right now, like tier one, in no particular order here, in no particular order, I think we would say Dallas, Eagles, 49ers. I, I to, to be honest, I think if, if we just ranked it on this season, I mean, so my, I think my that's what we would do. My hot take was I think Baltimore's closer to tier one than tier two, like due to all okay. the parity. I, well, I kinda, guess what? I mean, at this at this point, I do. No, 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 no. So we'll throw them in there. I, I I think that's a great point. I think Baltimore is in there, right? So let's so let's do that. So I think at tier one right now, we'd say Dallas, Baltimore, Eagles, 49ers. In no order, no particular in, in, right, right, right. In no particular order here. I'm with you. In, Okay, in tier two, I think we go. Uh, Depending on what you do with Baltimore, but I'm, I'm looking no, at no, the list. Ba here. Baltimore's tier one. I tier think you two, have Miami. I think you go Lions, I think, Miami. Think, yep. The Chiefs. Yes. And honestly, yep. may, we'll see where the Jacks come out at, after the record of this. But I think it's just those three teams. What I if, think I think everybody else is below that. Everybody. What if, the what if the Buffalo, Chargers what if, aren't there. What if Buffalo was seven and five right now? What if they're Buffalo's a Buffalo's a tier three team? Here's why: to, uh, not no fault of their own. Their defense is done, and that's not their fault, right? They've got injuries everywhere, right? Like like nobody's playing. Their whole defense is almost backups. We've got you know God. Uh, Von Miller out here getting in, in, in the legal troubles. Like, come on, guys. Like, what, what is happening? So they've just got a lot of stupid things that are happening with this team. 
And I, I, I just don't see it. So once again, we'll see where the Jags come out. Like right now, the Texans are probably tier two. I, I'm, yeah. I'm saying generally speaking, like they're, they're probably a tier two team in the NFL, despite the fact that they've kind of got this weird thing going on with them and the Colts. Like we got to figure out who's going to get in. And I don't think the Colts are tier two. Right. But and I, I I think you make a good point on the Jaguars. I mean, they're, they're – if they go out and take care of business on Monday Night Football, you know they're about to write their own destiny tonight. They are. If they win Absolutely. this, if they win and, and this game with Cincinnati, yeah, they win with Cincinnati. They're probably going to win the division easily. I, I think. Me, they, I think they get through. Let me, two two points I want to make, and you know you could spin it whichever way you want, but you know, go back five podcasts ago, maybe the sky was falling with San Francisco. Their defense looked like it was in shambles. Offensive line was hurt, and it was a shambles. Like we didn't make this up. It wasn't shambles. You know, they they lost to they lost to Cleveland, Minnesota, and Cincinnati, right? And then God, did they need a bye week? But what I'm saying is, five weeks in the NFL is an eternity. You go from looking like holy hell, what's going on, to wow, they're on the class of their own. Who knows what this every like? We'll be evaluating the situation in five weeks, and who knows, you know what what we're gonna say here? That's how crazy. The NFL has been, I think, it's kind of a war of nutrition at this point for some of these teams. But talking about Detroit, and obviously Jalen Hurts to Jared Goff is a gap based on what Jalen Hurts can bring to the team. But their issues and their strengths are kind of the same. They have uh, head coaches that like to gamble. They they have this uh, run game, you know, that's created behind a really good offensive line. They don't. I don't say I don't want to say they both need play action to thrive, but they're much better when play action is working. They got weapons on the outside, you know, who thrive off play action. They both have good defensive lines with absolutely atrocious secondary play. They're kind of similar in terms of, you know, what kind, you know, it depends on how the playoff scenario breaks out. Sorry, I got ring, I got people on my front porch. Um, they're, pro they're probably coming to get my neck after I'm, you know, crapping on the Eagles so much here in Northeastern Philly. But, you know, it depends because there's such a battle of, of strengths and weaknesses and parodies, and it's going to be really interesting to see how it breaks out. But, you know, like we've said on this podcast, it's kind of maybe a half a season, a season premature for Detroit to kind of get there. Like, you, you hit the right two or three pieces in the offseason, and boy, are we going to be sitting here in September saying, wow, Detroit could be a powerhouse? Like, absolutely. But, like you said, if you wanted to bet on the 49ers, you already missed the boat because you could have got much better odds five weeks ago. You don't want to bet them at three to one now. But with how crazy the NFL has been, who are we to sit here and say Detroit can't get hot and make it to the Super Bowl, though? Right. We Loose. I, So I think they can knock off the Niners. They could. Is it likely? Probably not. But this is the NFL. Detroit will get up 10 nothing in a ball game with San Francisco. I think anything could happen. You could say the same thing about eight or nine teams right now. Luke, let me say this. Here's the difference in the 49ers and everybody else. And, and I, I, I honestly believe this is the difference, right? So, yes, when the 49ers were losing those games, Trent Williams was not playing. And, yes, Debo Samuel was not playing. But here's something else they, they did that I think may be going overlooked. They went out and got Chase Young. After all this turmoil, they still got the best end of the stick. Luch, they went out and got Chase Young from Washington on basically, hey, come here, let's win a championship, and then you can do whatever whatever you want. That's what happened. They they went and got a – whoops. God, they picked up somebody else too. Like right there, right, right along with getting Chase Young. It's like they went out and got a guy that could be game-changing. Now you've got to deal with him and Bosa on the edges. Or they move them around. Like, that is what they did. Dre Greenlaw playing playing aggressively. Like, th this is what they did. Fred Warner playing aggressively. And getting another edge guy changes the complexity of their defense. So, you know, listen, hats off to the Eagles. They went and got Kevin Byatt because – and I think they did the right thing here, Luce. They were trying to do some type of shoring up on the secondary, but they need more, and they're not going to get it. That window's closed. So they got to figure it out with what they have. Uh, the Cowboys have to figure it out with what they have. And I – look, man, I don't I, I don't think I've counted out Patrick Mahomes. Well, I did start counting him out last season. 
because things weren't looking good for a good period of time. And that's how they look right now. But I think this time it's real loose. I don't know if they come out of the AFC. I, I There's a chance they're a one and done. There's a chance. I'm not saying it's likely, but they, they are, they can't move the football. I mean, here is case in point. Your quarterback could be the best gunslinger on the planet, generational talent. But if you don't have anybody else, you bracket covers Travis Kelsey. Eventually, someone else has to make a play. You have great play calling. I mean, Andy Reid, top five play caller, right? I mean, Patrick Mahomes, top two quarterback, maybe the best quarterback in the league, depending on who you ask. Probably is. Run game has been stepping up because it has to. They have they have to run the ball more than they have in years past. But just goes to show you, hey, you don't want to step up and bring anybody else in. They tried getting these kind of flashy guys in the draft. You know, Sky Moore was a dud. Kadarius Tony here come the health issues. He's been terrible, right? Justin Ross got hurt again. Uh, Marcus Valdez Scantling is horrible. Cost the game against the Eagles. Not solely, but you know the ball was literally in his hands as time was winding down. So we talk about in this pod, you know, you got to go get your quarterback some help. You know, Tyreek Hill leaves town. They were fine for a while, right? These teams have to be kicking themselves for not finding money to bring in DeAndre Hopkins. I say it and I'll say it again. Like I love DeAndre Hopkins has been nothing but a pro. He says the right things. He does the right things. I really hope he sticks around for another year in Tennessee. I feel like he really likes Nashville. He likes Mike Vrabel. But what I'm saying is, geez, Kansas City could be a different offense with DeAndre Hopkins. Listen, boy, if they had DeAndre Hopkins. They definitely win at least Luch, and I'm and I'm not I'm, I'm saying this wholeheartedly. I think they win at least two more games right now. Boy, and, if DeAndre Hopkins was opposite more. Stephon Diggs, no offense to Gabe Davis, but he's disappeared in the offense. Things could be different for Buffalo. Those were the two most rumored teams that you know he was going to land with. So, yeah, I, I'm with you. I think Kansas City is in trouble. Uh, they're going to make the playoffs. You know, on the flip side. Jordan Love has faced some pretty poor pass defenses, but you can't knock his progression over the last eight weeks or so. He's really been stepping up. He can't help who's on his schedule. Kansas City is a good, you know, above-average, formidable defense. They they like yeah. to send pressure. They like to play man coverage, and he played fantastic. So you got to feel good now as a Packers fan. Maybe week three, week four, you didn't feel so good. But now a massive win at Lambeau, if for nothing else, Big confidence booster heading into 2024. I think this could be a turning moment for Jordan Love and Green Bay. Here's what I will say. And, Luch, I'm going to do a slight look ahead, but it's not for us to get in the look ahead. I'm going to go back to the Jags really quick because we were talking about them writing their own destiny, right? We were talking about them writing their own destiny. And tonight they get a Cincinnati team. You see, Cincinnati may have been climbing into, into Tier 1, but Joe Burrow's done. Like So, so we, we can't include them in that conversation. But if they beat Cincinnati tonight, then now we're saying, okay, like they're probably probably on their way to winning the division. But here's the difference. They've got to go on the road to the Browns next week. And while I do think the Browns may be done because of their quarterback play, they still got to go into the dog pound. And they're going to have to earn that game. They're going to be in Cleveland. If they earn that game, Luke, the very next week, they get Baltimore at home. And guess what? Remember what we talked about. Here's my theme of this show. It's the no faith league. Baltimore, you want to show us you're in tier one, right? They're going to have to go on the road and beat Jacksonville. And especially if Jacksonville's got a couple consecutive wins, they could be riding high at home. Like, you get what I'm saying, Luch? Like, we're, we're, we're saying this all now, and in two weeks, the Ravens could lose to the Jags. Or Sunday night football. It's possible. I'm not saying they do they do or don't. I'm saying this is what we've been dealing with all season long. No faith football league. That, that's what this is. Anybody could lose any week to anyone. Absolutely. Uh, and one more team. And listen, Miami is going to absolutely steamroll Tennessee in next Monday night football. You know, I'll get I don't into, know that. I'll get, in, I, I I'll get no into clue. Tennessee. Oh, I am for sure. <laughs> no doubt. I think the line opened at 12 and a half. It should probably be 17. And it's not a Will no, no, Levis but, thing. It's not a Will no, Levis I, I thing. I get that. I, I get that. I get that, Luke. So here's I'm the thing. sitting here. I'm sitting here still begging for Miami to beat, you know, a, a playoff level opponent. And their defense statistically has been very good since Jalen Ramsey has come back and played football. Right. But, you know, okay. You play the commanders, you play the jets, you beat the Raiders, you lose to the chiefs, you know, you beat new England, you lose to the Eagles. 
You beat the Panthers. You beat the Giants. <laughs> I mean, you get steamrolled by the Bills. You beat the Broncos by 50. You beat the Chargers. I mean, the Chargers are terrible this year. I, there's not – I don't see a quality win. I, do, I don't see a quality win on the we Dolphins' schedule. We're saying the same thing and, about Dallas. We're saying the same you, thing about Dallas. That, that's why there's so many question marks here. And listen, yes. on offense, yes. Miami – Miami is exceptionally talented on offense. The great play calling. I need to see this defense against a quality opponent. We know Miami is going to post 30 to 50 points on the commanders, on the Titans, on, on Denver. Tyree Kill. Well, Tyree Kill should be the MVP. Is he going to get it? Probably not because they never gave it to a non-quarterback. But what Tyree Kill's doing is, is unbelievable. Like, I think he should be the MVP. I'm looking at the remaining schedule for Miami. Tennessee, the Jets. The Cowboys kind of like battle of like tier two, you know, maybe bottom tier one B teams and Baltimore and Buffalo. So we're not going to really get a feel for this team, in my opinion, until the last three weeks of the year. I'm so excited to see Miami take on those three uh, kind of opponents because it, it feels like the rest of the NFL has had their gauntlet schedule. And boy, uh, it's either going to be a really good or a really bad momentum thing for Miami to have this bang, bang, bang three games at the end of the year. Yeah, man, look, so that's the thing about Miami, man. Like, Miami's going to score points. I do think their defense is better. Here's how I'm measuring it, Luch, and I'm saying this in a way that's like, okay, we've seen Howell go out here and light up everybody. Even when they're down, Howell's putting up 250, 260, 270, 300, 40 passing tips. This defense held him in check yesterday. And so – Despite the fact that Washington is a bad football team, I have to measure them where they are. So they won 45 to 15. Last week, they played the Jets 34 to 13. Got to remember, Jalen Ramsey's been back, right? So Jalen Ramsey comes back, and I do think their defense is, is improved. But like you said, we're going to have to see it like in a couple weeks here. Now, you can't. You have to be who you're supposed to be. And so that's something for me, Luch, that gives me encouragement with some of these teams that we're seeing are tier one, like Dallas. Dallas went through a stretch where all the teams they were supposed to beat, they smashed them. And the Seahawks are a team I thought maybe they wouldn't have smashed, but they would have beat them by more than a touchdown, but they were able to pull the game out. The drawback to me on Dallas on that one was they were at home. It's not like they were on the road in Seattle. If they're on the road in Seattle – I get, it's a different vibe for me. But at home, winning by a touchdown against a team you probably should have beat by 10 to ten points to two touchdowns, that gives me some concern. D Dak's playing out of his mind. I like what he's doing. They're getting the ball to CD, blah, 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 blah. We need to see it in January. For the Dolphins, we need to see them beat a quality opponent. Um, and it's I, – I don't, I don't know if we're going to see it. You know, and I'm taking nothing away from Miami. They get the Dak. Cowboys on Christmas Eve, but that, that's that's their defining moment, I think, for this season. Then they get the Ravens, like you talked about. And then they get the Bills, so I think they should be at home. Miami and Dallas can't help who's on the schedule. Credit to Miami. They are not only beating the teams they should beat, they're absolutely demolishing them. So demolishing. I, I, yeah, I, demolition so, job. Like, for all purposes and, and fairness, I need to say Miami is a solid Tier 2 team. With Super Bowl contending upside, I have you know they have to be. Listen, I, I think in the AFC in they could win. I agree, totally. They, they, I don't the, the Chiefs. So hear me out. They played the Chiefs in Germany. They had a chance to win that game. They blew it. They just couldn't put enough points on the board late. Right? You know, turnover late cost them the game. Yep. The Chiefs aren't better than the Dolphins this year. That is not the case. Like they, they're more so they have more experience, right? Like, I'm saying the Chiefs as a team, as a staff at the quarterback position, a few defense, they have more experience. They know how to get the job done. They know what it feels like to win the Super Bowl. They know what it feels like to get there. They don't know what it feels like to go on the road and have to win all the games, though. Chiefs have never won, and they don't have as much talent. The Chiefs aren't going to the Super Bowl this year. That's number one. Number two, the Dolphins have to win. They, they have to beat. One of the two, preferably they probably want to beat the Ravens because they're in the conference. They need to beat Dallas or the Ravens. If they don't, I don't think it's going to be good for their psyche in the playoffs, Luke. 
Because at that point, they would not have really beaten a good team all season. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, at some point, they got to they got, they got to beat a good football team. And they're going to get their shot here real soon. Can we, can we review, before we look at a little bit of DFS and, and betting and props just from the previous week? Because I thought it was a really interesting week in, in DFS as well with, when, with such – Miami Tyreek Hill chalk and it was a really fascinating week to kind of build and take your stands and stuff like that. I mean that game collectively, Chief, you know, with Sam Howell and Washington on the other side was was fascinating because Sam Howell was what sixty one hundred, and you know you knew he was going to likely have a negative game script, and we know how, there, he threw the ball forty plus times I think in uh, what like sixty percent of his games this year. I think it might be more now. But the crazy thing is, and I don't have the updated target share numbers, it's so hard to, first of all, it's so hard to stack Sam Howell with anybody because he really distributes the ball to everybody. And and in real life football, that's awesome and, and good stuff from Sam Howell. And I do think he is a interesting quarterback prospect. I don't really know what the, how to grade him. They have such a bad defense. They've had so much shuffle in the organization. Um, but he has some weapons, but for example, Terry McLaurin, I'm looking in a single entry stiff arm, the, the 555, um, hundred total entry, super small field. I, I played a lineup in that, um, squeaked in the min cash, but like Terry McLaurin was 21%. Obviously, you know, that game was really popular. So people were looking not only for runbacks on the Washington side, um, but there were people, you know, using Sam Howell and McLaurin together, which is fine because it's really cheap. Sam Howell has the rushing upside. McLaurin had zero fantasy points in a game where they had a massive negative game script. Sam Howell week after week finds a way to get there with he his also rushing only upside. Had three targets, three targets, and it's been the same but, story but, all year. McLaurin but let me say had, this. But, I'm sorry. Let me, I'm, sorry I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Cut you off. Let me say this. McLaurin only had three targets. Sam Howell also didn't throw the ball as much as he's thrown it in weeks. Sam Howell has been throwing the ball 50, in that game <laughs> between forty and fifty times every week. This week, I think he only threw the ball 24, 25 times, 26 times. Like, they just didn't even have enough volume for them to get there. Like, I think I think that speaks to Miami's defense. I, I, I agree. I mean, I can't sit here and say Washington was like a juggernaut or anything, but um, Sam Howell didn't beat him. Like, Miami went out there and did their job. Maybe it was a slightly inferior opponent, but, yep. you know, I, I can't take that away. Washington hung in there with Philly. Washington hung in there with Philly. Philly did not beat Washington like 40 to 10. That's not what happened in that scenario, Luch. You see what I'm saying? Like, but once again, remember what we're talking about here. The NFL, the no faith league. Week to week, we don't know what we're going to get from some of the best or worst teams. It's it's unbelievable. We know the worst teams are going to lose. But it's just how competitive are they, right? How competitive are they this week? Steelers, you know, and I know I keep, I know I keep, listen, I'm driving this point home because I want people to understand it. Steelers had a chance to write their own destiny this week and they go out there and lose to the staking Cardinals. Come on. That was a bizarre game. Two weather, I know, weather pauses. I, know. I mean, and I know Kenny Pickett was out and I know, uh, you know, Mitch Trubisky had to finish the game. I, I get all of that, Luke. Like, I'm not – I understand. But it's the Cardinals, bro, and you're at home. You have to win that football game. He, here's the problem with stacking Washington. Their highest target share on the team is 19%. Kurt, which is McLaurin. But, you know, when you want an alpha receiver with your stack, that doesn't cut it. That's not a guy where you feel great about playing your quarterback with. Well, but but they throw it so much, Lucy. Nineteen percent for him is like eight to twelve targets. That's Good the point. difference. When Good they're point. throwing it forty something times, and he's getting ten to twelve targets, I'm like, great. Yesterday, when you throw it twenty five times, it's like, well, okay. And then you have like, Curtis Samuel, Dotson, and Logan Thomas all have a thirteen percent target share. All of them. I think this was before. This is not updated from uh, this current week, but it, it, even with the the increased volume, it's. It's not a situation where you're getting, you know, C.D. Lamb 15 targets, right? Like, you're not you're not getting that. I mean, McLaurin has the most first read volume, too. Uh, 24% first read, not elite again. But like you said, with the volume, the, the production okay. just hasn't been there. Let, let me it's, say this. Let me say this. 
I'm going to go back. And I, God, I feel like we're bouncing around today, but it's the best kind of, uh, of uh, organic bouncy. Well, that game was a huge part of last week, so I figured we needed to talk about that for yeah, fantasy purposes. Absolutely. But here's what I'm saying. Imagine, I'm going to pull out, pull out Elmo from Sesame Street. Imagine, imagine, imagine. Imagine if Terry McLaurin played in Kansas City. See, 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 what we don't want to acknowledge sometimes, Luch, is one player can change the organization, and it doesn't have to be the quarterback. See, remember, Patrick Mahomes is generational, but no Tyreek Hill changes what's happened in that team. Now, here's what happened. They went out and won a Super Bowl last year, and so everybody wants to devalue what Tyreek Hill brought to that team. Do, do you give because they won a Super Bowl? But what are you seeing this season? They don't have anybody that can really take the top off the defense. They don't have anybody that really has sure hands outside of Travis Kelsey. And they needed someone and they didn't do it. You see what I'm saying? They, 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 they're treating Mahomes like Tom Brady, and he's earned that. But Tom Brady still had sure handed receivers, they just weren't superstars. When you look down the line and you're talking about Wes Welker, right, and you're talking about Gronk, and you're talking about Julian Edelman, while those guys may not have had breakaway speed, they weren't Randy Moss. Here's what we knew, Lutz, late in the game, minute 20 seconds left. Tom Brady gets the ball at the 20. We know if Julian Edelman runs a 10-yard out route and Tom Brady has it there on time, he's catching it, he's getting out of bounds. We don't have to wonder, or we didn't have to wonder, excuse me, whether or not Julian Edelman was going to catch a pass if he was open. We didn't have to worry about whether or not Julian Edelman was going to catch a pass if he had three people on him. Same thing for Wes Welker. With Kansas City, I don't know if Sky Moore is going to catch a pass if he's wide open. MVS, Rasheed Rice, um, uh, Kadarius Toney. I, I, I don't know. What's going to happen in the last minute and 20 seconds of the game anymore with Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs? That should tell us something. Luch, two years ago, we didn't have to worry about this. What did we say? Patrick Mahomes gets it late. You might as well hand this team a touchdown. That is not the case anymore. Now, look, once again, they did not call the PI yesterday. But even the possession before that, Luch, Patrick Mahomes has got a chance. He throws an interception. Guess who that ball was to? Oh, I'll tell you, it was to Sky Moore. Now, did the DB make a heck of a read? Yes. But my point is, there's no certainty in the Chiefs passing game. They're not going to the Super Bowl, and one guy can make that much of a difference. They should have went out and got a D-hop. They should have went out and tried. They should have tried to get them some type of bona fide number one guy. And guess what? Travis Kelsey would be having an even better season. Why? You can't cover them all. Okay, Luke, I digress. I'm going to let that go. Please, please clean this up. Clean well, up. In, in different circumstances, but it's also hard to stack Patrick Mahomes in daily fantasy. By the way, out of 233 wide receivers and tight ends with at least 50 routes run this season, Terry McLaurin ranks 139th in catchable target percentage. So he's just not getting catchable targets. Exactly. That's what it was. Hold on. Where's he at here? Yeah. Well, it makes sense to me, Luch, when he's getting 12 targets and then he catches four balls for 60 yards. I'm sorry. That's 179. The... 179. Yes. Luke, so that's the story of his season. Eight to 12 targets a game with three and four right. catches for 50 yards, 40 yards, 45 what's, yards. What's the quality of volume? They is exactly. straight back and throw, and it's not good. Hi. Total 180, look at San Francisco. Brock Purdy throws the ball only 27 times, completes just 19 passes, throws for 300 yards. Why? Because he has it's a, an amazing scheme. You have Yak Monsters with, D, with Debo running through the secondary. I mean, Purdy's A dot's not massive. He has guys who create after the play, and a lot of it is because of the scheme. He's getting quality targets to his receivers. He might only – it's a low-volume attack. He – Debo, Ayuk might only have four to five to six targets a week, but they have chances to make explosive plays. Whether if you're just running go routes with Terry McLaurin in the second half for 50-50 balls, it's going to show up as a target in the in the stat sheet. His A dot's going to look fantastic, but the quality of, of targets going to be god awful, right? Yeah. I would take the five the five elite quality targets per game with someone like Debo 
you know, than Terry McLaurin right now. On the flip side, you can't really play Patrick Mahomes in fantasy football right now because the only guy I feel comfortable stacking him with is Travis Kelsey, who's too priced up. Neither one of these guys are really having ceiling games this year. I mean, I can't go out in a single entry and say, you know what, I'll play Mahomes with Sky Moore and then pay up elsewhere because Sky Moore, more likely than not, might have less than four points. Correct. I just can't do it. So, you know, the matchups are great, but, you know, Sam Howell gets there every week somehow with his rushing upside. Who do you pair him with? I don't know. Maybe you just go for the value with Curtis Samuel. He kind of has that lower A dot. You know, he's not getting 50-50 balls. Maybe that's what you do if you want to play Sam Howell. But Brock Purdy, ceiling game, did it in an efficient manner. He was able to use get his playmakers, which is a testament to Kyle Shanahan, uh, scheming this thing up and calling the right plays. And, you know, he gets his 300 yards with his guys running after the catch, right? I feel like Sam Howell earns every yard he actually gets through the air because, you know, it's yeah. so one-dimensional for the most part in Washington. Anyway. Uh, it was just a crazy day in DFS, and that Miami game kind of dictated a lot, and there was a, a lot of interest in that uh, San Francisco game as well. But, I mean, I know just for time purposes, I'd love to touch on more uh, from the previous week. And, you know, there were some injuries and some brutal things, but let's just do a look ahead. Let's just do a look ahead. And, yeah, you know, I, I, I just want to start off by, by saying – uh, Miami, I, I think, is going to steamroll Tennessee on Monday Night Football. But that Titans-Colts game was electric. It was crazy. Uh, the Titans are not a good football team right now. However, they lost five one-score games this season. So, you know, imagine if that was split. Or maybe if they had the Vikings or Eagles magic and were able to squeak out those one-score games. Maybe we'd be having a different conversation. Will Levis looked fantastic in that game. The Tennessee Titans have no O-line. Their secondary is absolutely atrocious. Uh, in that game, you know, it's worth noting Derrick Henry's in concussion protocol. Great. Jeffrey Simmons, top two defensive lineman in the league, defensive tackle, messed up his knee, and he's questionable as well. The Titans had two punts blocked. Ryan Stonehouse got his leg mangled, one of the best punters in the league, and he is out. Um, and also Nick Folk shanked an extra point that Ryan Tannehill had. Um, which would have put the Titans up by one point late in regulation, uh, which took away Will Levis's game-winning drive, So, uh, which he found DeAndre Hopkins in the end zone, by the way. So I really can't say enough good things about Will Levis, who's doing so much more with less. The, the offensive line's brutal. Um, you know, Then he led the Titans to a field goal in overtime. The defense couldn't hold up. So he had a chance for two game-winning drives. It uh, didn't get either one of them. You know, Credit to the Colts and Gardner Minshew for you know, doing their thing and getting Michael Pittman the football. But... The Titans on the wrong side of another one-score game, and it's going to be uh, pretty brutal in Miami if their stars uh, can't go. But just wanted to say I'm, I'm thrilled with Will Levis so far, and you know Tennessee has 100 mil in cap space, and if they keep losing, maybe they'll get the kid from Notre Dame up front to protect Levis. A lot of receivers in free agency. I, I just I'm really hoping D Hop comes back, but uh, Miami next week. Uh, that's a team that you know, Miami should beat this version of the Titans by at least two touchdowns. Vegas also thinks so. Uh, The Colts, you know, getting it done, and they're kind of in the thick of this playoff picture as well. Zach Moss was the mega chalk, and he really didn't do anything. He had seven fantasy points. In the 555 single entry, he was 86% owned. Uh, And he was probably more than that in double ups and 50 50s, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, But kudos to the Colts. But it was the right call. He he should have been that high on getting that type of volume. Like, you can't, if he picked up 12 points, like, that was fine. He ended up with, virtually nothing and we still had guys that were making big money with him in their lineup so it's just it is what it is yeah i'm with you so that, that was a big takeaway for both teams another one score loss and a, a couple of huge injuries for tennessee um and a, a, you know indy staying alive right in that afc playoff hunt so kudos to them for having exciting football and they get um, the Bengals coming up this week in another in team that's hurting Bengals on a short yeah. week yeah 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 but what else are you looking at for this coming week? Any games sticking out to you? Well, I think uh, for me, you know, when I look over the, the grand scheme of things, it's this Bills Chiefs game, um, and then the and then the Eagles play the Cowboys. I, I think those are the two big ones this week, Luch. Like um, Bills are in Kansas City, and Eagles are on the road in Dallas. If Dallas beats Philly at home, then they split the season series. And uh, if the Bills lose to the Chiefs, they're for sure, I think, out of the playoffs at this point. 
I think if they lose this week, like they're officially done, essentially, because then the next week the Cowboys come to them, and I will expect the Cowboys to beat them. If the Cowboys beat Philly, now I know that there's some, there's some, um, let's call it emotional variance loose that we can't quantify. If Dallas beats Philly, I think that's going to be a high win. Now they got an emotional win. They got to come off that high and go up to Buffalo and try to beat them too. Like I understand that part of the game, and I do think that part of the game exists. We just can't quantify it, of course. But if if the Bills lose to the Chiefs, I'm going to expect them to lose to the Cowboys for what it's worth. Would you Would you agree there? I don't know. At this point, I don't know. Well, it's the no faith league. I get it. I I do like the Bills this week, and I kind of want to take the points. Kansas City is a two and a half point favorite right now. A healthy game total of 47 and a half. Um, man, I, I want to look into that game a little bit. Josh Allen, 8,300, most expensive quarterback on DraftKings. Patrick Mahomes, 7,900. Lamar, 77 against the Rams at home. Uh, I, I gotta, I, I, I'm going to try to trust Lamar in this spot and probably get let down. That makes sense. Uh, I was thinking Lamar. And you got CJ against the Jets. Uh, you know, one thing you could say, you know, the Jets defense is, is pretty good, but, you know, Houston should have good field position, you would think, for most of that game. Yeah. I have J- Justin Herbert in Denver. And for me, I think the big one is it's like a, a grudge match from a couple weeks ago. Actually, it was when I was at King of the Beach. It's Detroit-Chicago game, and Justin Fields looked pretty good, and Chicago had a lead in that game, and they pissed down their own leg because they played ultra-conservative. Like, Justin Fields didn't have an opportunity, in my opinion, on the last two drives of that game from a month ago because they got so conservative. He had 24 DK points, and I feel like he left opportunities on the table because of the really conservative play calling, and I don't think they'll let that happen again. So, like, for fantasy purposes, that game's kind of sticking out to me. You know, Justin Fields at 68 um, and Jared Goff at 64. I know he played our, his worst game of the season against Chicago last month. Yeah, for uh, sure, for sure. But I think that game is kind of interesting. Do we have a total on that game? Let's see here. Uh, 42 and a half, so pretty low total. Not great, but, um, you know, we know Fields' upside is with his legs for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. But you're right. I mean, that Buffalo-Kansas City game is going to be interesting. And, I want to break down some coverages and things like that. And, and um, to but, me, that's 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 closing the night off or closing the day out with two really pivotal games. So we get Bills Chiefs at 425. That game will roll until about you know somewhere in the 7 o'clock area. You know, and then we get Eagles-Cowboys for Sunday night football, which, which should lead to an exciting finish to the day. Because most of the one o'clock games, in my opinion, are games that we anticipate the teams will win. Like the Patriots are playing, the, no, excuse me, not the Patriots. The, the Texans are playing the Jets. The Rams are playing the Ravens. Like I don't see excitement, Luch, in any of these games. Now, Buccaneers Falcons is going to be important because of the division race, but I still don't see excitement. Do you, you know what I'm saying? I think at the end of the night we get excitement, hopefully, and that 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 should lead to just some really fun real football games to watch as we as we close up week 14 at least for Sunday. Yeah, looking at running back McCaffrey 9200 against Seattle, a team he just carved up the previous week. Alvin Kamara against your Carolina Panthers. Hey, he finally got a couple of touchdowns last week and he had another one wiped off the board um because of a penalty and I think Taysom Hill plunged it in. Uh Eckler's against Denver, he's sub 8k. Um, let's see here. Josh Jacobs back on the slate. We know they love to give him volume, even though it's a little bit of a tough matchup. Josh Jacobs has been having elite volume since the coaching change, by the way. I think that's interesting. Um, Jameer Gibbs in that Chicago game. Where, what are they doing? Zach Moss, 5,900. So they finally priced him up. I tell you what, though, that Bengals defense is so bad against the run. And maybe people will get off Zach Moss a little bit after he kind of dumped his massive chalk last week that I actually might be interested in going back to Zach Moss in this matchup. Uh, let's not get it twisted. Tennessee, terrible pass defense. They had a couple blips in the middle of the season where they gave up the run a little bit. But before that, you know, dating back a couple of seasons, they were arguably a top two run defense in the NFL. Cincinnati's not that same uh, defensive front on a short week, so... Mm-hmm. I kind of want to go back to Zach Moss. You know, the, the big sticker price here uh, in terms of jumping up $1,300. But, man, uh, that's sticking out to me right now. We're, running back-wise, are any of these matchups 
yeah, make it any sense to you? Uh, I mean, hear me out. Like, like where? Go, 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 before, go, go. before I ask you that, like, where does where is Kansas City gonna score if they can? We know Buffalo's defense isn't very good. Can Isaiah Pacheco do damage on the ground at sixty seven hundred? Are they gonna keep leaning on him? Well, I think they are. If uh, if we don't get any, um, what's his face? Jeez, God, I'm I'm, I'm losing his name. Jared McKinnon. It, yeah, if Jared McKinnon continues to sit, like, I mean, Pacheco already owned the backfield, but I'm saying with no McKinnon, I mean, it's just him and Ceh, and I, I don't know what Ceh did to not get any any traction in this offense. I mean, it feels like so. Here, so that's another stupid thing to me, Luke. Hear me out here. They have no sure-handed receivers, and they've got two running backs that could probably play receiver. Why in the world aren't we being creative with CEH and Jarek McKinnon? Like, it feels like to me, I would be in two running back sets almost all game and then just flank one of them out at receiver. CEH and McKinnon have better hands than 80% of their receivers. It makes no sense. Okay, with that being said, I think if the Chiefs attack the Bills, I got to think it's going to be through the run. And what I mean, Luch, is I think they may run to set up the pass. And I'm not talking about play action. I'm saying they get going, they get going, and then they just strategically sprinkle in the passing game, right? Then maybe then maybe they use the pass to set up the run, right? They hit Kelsey. Hopefully they, they'll probably hit Rasheed Rice on a couple of swing passes, stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you see Isaiah, Sonic the Hedgehog Pacheco hit, hitting an outside zone scheme run and pops him for 15. Like that's that's what I think we see in this game. And because here's the thing, Andy Reid isn't going to limit Patrick Mahomes in terms of his throwing loops. And Mahomes has been an extension of the running game, believe it or not. Like, you know, most games he's rushing for over 20 yards a game on, you know, three to four scrambles which is helping them keep drives alive, so forth and so on. So I, I'm i going to give this game to the Chiefs, but I think Josh Allen and the Bills have an outside chance to win this game if their offense is humming along. So Kansas City, I don't, I, I'm using fantasy points data. I don't think it included yesterday's games, but they play the most too high coverage in the league and they play a top 10 rate of man, I think. And we're talking extremely low sample sizes here. Josh Allen has 30 dropbacks against man coverage, two high looks this year. He's only completed 52% of the passes, but he's thrown five touchdowns in those 30 dropbacks against it. So that that's interesting. Um, his, yard, his YPA is not great. Yards per eh, Actually, seventh in the league. There's only been 10 quarterbacks with 25 or more dropbacks. Um against that coverage and i'm not really shocked you know, a lot of the league plays zone a lot of zone so there are a few teams that play a ton of man i mean kansas city's the top 10 but you know the giants play a lot of man um tampa bay plays a lot of man dallas and the eagles play a lot of man that's why we like you know if you have an offensive line that can hold up against like the eagles or the cowboys we love you know looking at those alpha receivers dk metcalf metcalf He's the man coverage guy in Seattle. Tyler Lockett's the zone guy. A.J. Brown is the man guy in, in Philly um, to go against those coverages. So I, I, we'll have to see. They're single high man teams, though. Kansas City plays too high. So I'm not sure. I'm assuming Stephon Diggs will be the possession guy. We'll see. But uh, Kansas City, that defense has been carrying them. But this is a huge – so much at stake for really both teams. Oh. A little bit more for Buffalo. Yeah. But it's, it's going to be great. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Let's see here. Let's just take a quick look at wide receiver. All right, Diggs is the highest priced receiver, 88. Uh, Keenan Allen, 8,600 at Denver. Maybe we'll see some Justin Jefferson off a of bye at 8,500. Now, who knows who the quarterback will be? It'll probably be Josh Dobbs. Amon Ross St. Brown, 8,200 against Chicago. Seems like the high floor, high ceiling cash game type play at that price. He really does. Um, and you got Mike Evans, Jamar Chase, Nico Collins against the Jets. Um. Yeah, how about it? I think this thing is probably screaming an Amon Ross, St. Brown kind of chalk week when we're looking up top here. Yeah, probably so. Um, Amon Ross was someone I had massive exposure to this week. But 
I mean, he got the touchdown. He just didn't get there, like, in terms of yards because they were up by so much. And the Saints, I mean, they, they were playing from behind. The Saints were. And, I mean, Amon Ra just didn't really have to get involved in this game late. So, um, hopefully this week that will – it'll be a rebound spot for him. I do think sneakily the Broncos can hang a number on the Chargers, at, at, at least statistically. Like, they could score some points in this game. Like, this could be a nice Sutton – um Jerry Judy game and I, and I know we haven't seen Rush throw for over 200 yards and feels like forever but I mean this could be a game where Rush could pop for 250 and and, and two touchdowns it, because the rushing upside has been there with Rush that's something that I don't think we've talked about the rushing upside for Rush has been there this season and he's not taking big hits he's just he's running he's sliding he's getting out of bounds he's getting down and he's you know racking up 30 40 yards a game You know, I feel for the Broncos fans. What a roller coaster of emotions. You have the terrible start. You know, is is Jerry Judy going to be dealt? Well, he's still with the team. You have Jerry Judy drama, and he hasn't performed. You bring Javante Williams back so slowly. Is Sean Payton a good coach? Man, if they could have went in there in Houston, they were down in the red zone as time was expiring. They would be a game back of Kansas City um, right now in the loss column if they could have got it done in Houston. Um, and then Kansas City went up and lost Sunday Night Football. So it was a massive opportunity for the Broncos to make this thing really interesting down the stretch in the AFC West. And they're only two games back, but but still, I mean, that would have been a massive swing for them. Uh, you know, just for time purposes, now we got to start heading out soon. And, folks, there are plenty of Roto Grinder shows and a ton of content on the way this week if you – you know, are new to the show, you know what we are. We like to chop it up like we're at the barbershop or having a drink at the bar with you. And, you know, we'll pop some nuggets in about coverages and things like that. But with how crazy these injury reports have been, hopefully you just like chilling with us. And maybe you agree with some of our stuff. We hope you do. And hopefully you don't agree with some of our stuff because maybe it'll <laughs> it'll tick you off more to just tune in next week when we give your team a, a garbage tier three rating or something <laughs> <laughs> but uh my man i'll pass it over to you you got anything from story time what's going on in your life this past week well priester so story time for me um look everybody knows i got married this year and i just want to say my wife is amazing she's uh gosh she's just so great but it's about her but it's about our interactions and it's it's about christmas Luke. so we know that christmas is coming up one of the things that's been exciting for us is uh going out looking for decorations because we're, we're starting to like you know really you know get get the house decorated for christmas and so yesterday we semi like we're, we're like i'll call it 80 to 90 percent done with our christmas tree one of the things that was cool about the christmas tree is when my wife started she's um i, I think she was either on maybe i don't know TikTok or instagram some form of social media where she was just kind of looking at Christmas ideas. Maybe she saw some stuff on Pinterest. I don't I don't want to lie, but I think it, maybe it was a combination of all three. But she's just kind of looking at stuff and ideas. And so she's got this amazing vision for the tree. Now, keep in mind, Luch, uh, I told her, I said, hey, you 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 just do whatever you, you think is best. And I'm going to be here, you know, stringing up ornaments and trying to help with, with whatever I can do, right? So she's got this, I guess, vision that she's putting together for the tree. You know, we agreed on some colors. So this year we're going with classic Christmas colors. So it's like red and gold, basically, is what we have on the tree. Red and gold. Nice classic Christmas, right? And so she starts, so the first thing she does, she starts with the ribbon on the tree. She started there. She, she saw this idea. And so um, I don't know what it's called, so I can't tell you that. But it's not like a traditional spiral ribbon that's going like around the tree up to the top. And so she starts with it and she uh, she says, so, hey, what do you think? And I said, well, I don't I don't know what's happening. Right. It, I don't I don't I know what's happening. I said, I can't see what you see. I said, why don't we we just keep going with your vision for the tree, putting the other ribbons in, putting the ornaments, doing all the things you want to do. And Lucha, I got to tell you, man, we, like I said, we're 80% done. We got to, you know, go and do some more things. She's got picks in the tree, like gold accents and pine cones with all this other stuff. But Lucha, when we finish the tree, right, or we're 80% done, 
I think it's like one of the most beautiful trees ever. I mean, it looks so good. Why, why am I telling this story? Because I like to parlay this stuff into like real life for whatever reason. It's just how my brain works. The tree to me this year and just doing that with her and interacting with her, it's just like real life, right? Like you got to get a good vision about yourself, right? You want to do something. You want to you be a doctor. You want to be a lawyer. You, you, you want to be a fireman. You want to be a policeman. You want to be a teacher. You want to be an NBA player. You want to be a major league baseball player. You want to change careers. You want to go back to school. You want to get married. You wanna, all these things, right? You got to get a blueprint for yourself in your mind. And you just go start, right? And guess what? You're probably going to ask someone, hey, what do you think about this? And they may give you, I don't know, or I, I don't know about that. I think that's crazy. Well, guess what? For, first and foremost, it's not their vision. It's your vision, right? It's your view of what you want to do. And you just keep building. You just keep decorating, right? You keep adding the pieces that you need. And in the end, you're going to end up with a beautiful Christmas tree. You're going to achieve the results. You're going to get to the goal that you want to get to. That's life, right? That that's, that's what life is. Life becomes more beautiful the more you put in. So invest in yourself, invest in your vision, and in the end, you're going to be just fine. That's story time for the week. Yeah, man. Investing in yourself is easier said than done sometimes. I mean, you know, you put other people first and if you um, sometimes I feel selfish when I try to do something for myself once in a while or take oh, time man, for myself. Oh man, talk about it. Talk about but you it. Yeah, but you have to. And and right now I'm kind of guilty of it. I mean, even you know microcosms like little things. Like um, uh, two months ago I was like getting back into shape, pretty pretty you know pretty good. I put on some weight. I know I needed to lose some weight. I just had so many things going on. We bought a house. Like I had minimal time. Um, and I've been slacking a little bit. But you got to just you know got to stop making excuses and put yourself first sometimes. And yeah. find time, find time. There aren't enough hours in the day. That's for sure. It sure doesn't feel like it sometimes, I man. Wish each day had like five more hours in it. That'd be great. <laughs> like just, just. But you know, I know I have to do it. I have to hold myself accountable. You know, yeah. and, and like you said, you got to yeah. put the time in, and things don't happen overnight. Whether it's your career, whether it's for yourself. I mean, I, I career-wise, I've been told no a million times, and there are times you want to give up, and times you want to stop. I mean, I've been in journalism since I was in college basically now. And um, I actually just fired off a random email to Roto Grinders years ago. I said, this is who I am. I've, I'm pretty good at DFS. I have like a decade of editorial experience. I think I could bring some stuff to the table. Hey, do you want to hop on a call? Always hop on a call. Like there's no reason to say no. Even if you don't think you're interested in something, like you never know who you're going to network with. That's the incredible thing too, right? And yeah. as I've become older, I've been coming a little more introverted. I need to like kind of just get myself out there a little bit more. I guess I just hate people more as I get a little older, <laughs> or just rather be in you know the cozy house with a roof over your head. But gotta get out there and keep <laughs> talking to people, right? <laughs> yeah, man, for sure. And as they say around the corner in my hood, for sure. When I was in high school, for sure. Hey, let's get out of here. Thanks for tuning in to motivational speech with Chief and Luch this week on this edition of Food for Thought. Hope you enjoyed it, Chief. Anything else? Or are we out of here? Nah, man, I am good. Thanks so much for joining us. Hopefully you enjoyed the show. We'll see you back here next week. Good luck, everybody. Take care.